Today we will continue with Ampere's law. So remember from chapter 21 that we have calculated electric field and electric field was uh, proportional to the charge and the distance from the charge to the point where we measure the electric field. Okay, so um, if there are many sources of electric field for some point, you have to sum all of them by using that equation. But we have a much easier method, which is given by the Gauss law, okay? So if you have electric flux, E times dA, this is closed surface, which is equal to Q enclosed over epsilon zero. So if you know the total charge within the enclosed surface, okay, then you can calculate electric field. This is given by the Gauss law. We have done it in chapter 22. So this is much easier method to calculate electric field, okay, compared to that one. We have done it. Like this one, in order to calculate the magnetic field in, in certain point produced by currents, okay, so you have to um, calculate infinitesimal magnetic field and then uh, take the sum all the, the magnetic fields then you can calculate magnetic field in certain point, like this one, okay, very similar. But instead of using this one, again, we can use much easier method, okay, for many cases. So we have here line integral BDL, which is equal to mu zero times I enclosed. Look at that one, Q enclosed gives us the electric field, over surface integral. Here, I enclosed gives us the magnetic field, um, magnetic field, which is calculated by solving the line integral. This is surface integral, this is line integral, don't forget. What about the Gauss law for magnetic fields? Here we have, so this formula, which we have learned in the previous chapter, Gauss law, I mean, magnet, this is electric flux, this is the magnetic flux. And magnetic flux for a closed surface is zero, okay? Which we have learned during the last lecture. So you cannot use that formula to calculate B, okay? So in order to calculate B produced by the currents, we can, we can use that formula, line integral uh, of, uh, of, um, line integral of B, let's say. So today we will, we will learn how to get that formula and we will uh, solve some symmetric uh, shapes and try to calculate magnetic field uh, due to currents through that uh, symmetric shapes. So this, this rule is called as Ampere's law. This is called as Gauss law, for electric field, Gauss law for magnetic field, and this is the Ampere's law, okay? Don't forget. Okay, so now let's consider that we have here a wire, which is very long and straight conducting wire, okay? And we drive current I through that wire. So let's try to apply Ampere's Low on that on that uh, wire. So um, in the previous lecture on Tuesday, we have found that there is a magnetic field around that wire, which is given by the right hand rule. Okay, so um, the thumb is showing the direction of the current and the fingers will show us the direction of the magnetic field at any place around the wire, right? And we have calculated magnetic field. We have done it during the last lecture and we have done it by using that expression, okay? We have calculated this one by using that expression during the last lecture we have done. So then let's uh, try to use 
the line integral of B around a circular closed path with radius R. So let's look at that picture from the cross section. Let's consider that this is the current, okay, this one, but the direction of its current is from, um, from the page to us, okay? This is the direction of the current. And by applying right-hand rule, we have magnetic fields and the direction of the magnetic fields are given like this. They are always tangent to the, um, to the circle here. And just choose very small segments here on that surface, on that circle, okay? Very small segments, the L, okay? And this is the radius of that circle, okay? You just choose a circle here with some certain radius R, okay? Then apply the line integral of B. Uh, this is the closed pass, don't forget this, okay? But we are not talking about the surface. This is just pass, okay? So um, at any point on that circle, on that pass, B and DL are parallel to each other, you see? Then, so since this is scalar product, I can only take the parallel component of B because perpendicular component, if there is any, will give zero, okay? So then, since B is equal everywhere, I mean the magnitude of the B is everywhere around that circle, around that path. We have also learned this one during the last lecture. Since B is constant, take this one out of the integral, okay? And we have calculated B for such system during the last lecture. Put that B here, okay? And then what is DL? Integral of, line integral of DL. DL is, if you take all DLs, we will get circumference of the circle, right? Which is given by two pi r. So two pi r here, two pi r here. Then the line integral of B will give us mu times, mu zero times, current passing through on that wire. So this is, the, um, this is the Ampere's law for a long and straight conductor. Now let's change the integration pass. Here we have integration pass like this, perfect circular, and there is a current in, within, the, within the circle. But what happens if I choose an integration pass like this? Look at the integration pass. Here I have same current like this one, okay? But within the integration pass, there is no current here. Here I choose an integration pass, which is including a current in the center. But here within that integration pass, there is no current. There is current here outside of the integration pass, but nothing inside. So let's see what will happen. If you look at that formula, if the current is zero, then this should give us the zero, right? If the current is zero here. Again, you can consider that if there is no current within that integration pass, then this should give us the zero, okay? Then let's check it whether if it is correct or not. So here we have four segments. One is from A to B, B is here. The other one is from B to C. The other one is C to D. And the, the last one is from D to A, okay? We have four parts of integral if you solve that integral. So um, what about the magnetic field? So uh, we, we know that there is a, there is a current here, then by right hand rule, I know that the direction of the magnetic field is like this, okay? Like this, you can consider. So 
here within that segment, the direction of the B and the L are parallel. And here, the direction of the B is like this, but the direction of the DL perpendicular to the B. And here, this is the direction of the integration path, okay, DL. And this is the direction of the magnetic field. They are antiparallel to each other. And what we have here, this is the direction of the DL. And this is the direction of the B. They are perpendicular to each other, okay? So then let's take some of them. The first one, B1 integral from A to B, this case, we have dl here okay b1 times dl since b is constant i'm taking this one out okay so what is the magnitude of b b is given by this one mu zero i over two pi r mu zero i over two pi r one okay radius of that that pass okay r one put it there and here we have uh, dl okay and now let's go to the second segment integral from b to c okay from b to c what we see here b and dl are perpendicular to each other and scalar product of b times dl will give us zero okay this component is zero and look at this one from c to d here we have direction of the dl here we have direction of the b and the cosine 180 degrees will give us negative number okay because they are antiparallel to each other and then we have this equation so what is the magnitude of b2 mu zero i over 2 pi r but now we have different radius you see plus the last one dl and b are perpendicular to each other then again we will have zero contribution from d to a so now let's have a look this one what is dl dl is very small segment on that surface let me draw like this so if you consider that this is a circle we have done it in the past but i will just repeat it for you Let's say this is dl, okay? And this is d theta, and this is r, then dl is given by r times d theta. You remember this one from the physics one, and this in that semester, we have also done it for several times. So instead of dl, just put this one, r times d theta. Here we have r1 times d theta, okay? Here we have r2 times d theta, and this r1 will cancel this guy, okay? Sorry, I did that. So here again, they will cancel each other. The pen is not working here. So this r1 will cancel this, this r2 will cancel this r2, this r1 will cancel this r1, then, here we will have mu zero i times d theta over two pi, and here we have negative of it. Okay, the result will be zero. So the line integral is zero. The result of line integral is zero. If there is no current passing through the area bounded by the pass. So since there is no current within that pass, the line integral will give us zero, okay? Here we have another pass, but we have current within that pass, then the line integral is different from zero for that condition, which is given by mu zero times i. But here the result is zero. Any question here in that part? Okay. Then let's continue. Here, within, within that closed pass, we have just single wire like this one, okay? Just single wire. 
let's consider that we have many wires within that closed pass, okay? One wire is like this, the other one here, the other one here, and the direction of the current here is up, and the direction of the current is opposite, and the direction of the current is up again here. So the currents in that lines, in that conductors, are in the same direction, but it is in the opposite direction. So what will happen in such cases, okay, if we have many conducting wires, current carrying conducting wires within a closed loop, then we will write that line integral of B like this, B D L, this is um, closed pass, and which is equal to mu zero times I enclosed. I enclosed is the total current within that closed pass, okay? Like Q enclosed in electric field chapter. So this equation is valid for conductors and pass of any shape. Here we have a circular shape. Here we have another shape. Here we have, okay, another shape. So it doesn't matter this, rule this equation is valid for conductors and pass off any shape. In addition to that, if the integral around the closed pass is zero, if the result of that integral is zero, only that the total current through an area bonded by pass is zero. It means that the total current or enclosed current is zero. And it does not mean necessarily that the magnetic field is zero everywhere along the path. So magnetic field can be different from the zero, okay? But if the total current or enclosed current is zero within that closed path, then this line integral of B will give us zero. So now let's try to solve very um, easy question field of a long straight current carrying conductor. During the last lecture, I have given that example and I have solved it for you. This is the conducting wire, which is carrying current, okay? And this is the direction of the magnetic field, which is found by the right-hand rule. And in order to calculate the B, we have applied that formula during the last lecture. So DB, very small um, magnetic field due to the very small segment on that surface is given by that expression. So then we have calculated the magnetic field like this during the last lecture by using that formula. Let's try to calculate this magnetic field by using the Ampere's law. So here we have line integral, and we only take the parallel component of the magnetic field, okay? Let's consider this is the direction of the magnet, uh, direction of the current from page to us, and this is the closed pass around that wire, let's say, okay? And by applying right-hand rule, this is the direction of the magnetic field around that closed pass, this is the radius, and these are the DLs, okay? So then, B is constant everywhere on that surface, only its direction is changing, okay? Then take B is out, and DL, what was the uh, in closed integral of DL? DL is the circumference of that circle, which is given by two pi r, and which is equal to mu zero times i, okay? Because total current i enclosed is given by i. Put I here, then take B from that equation, you will find that expression. So this result is same as we found by using that equation in the previous lecture. So um, then let's continue with another example. This is field of a long cylindrical conductor. This is example 28.8 from the uh, book. 
here we have a cylindrical conductor. Uh, its radius is given by R. This is the current passing through that conductor, right? And the current is uniformly distributed over the cross-sectional area of the conductor. Then what is the question? Find the magnetic field produced by that uh, current carrying cylindrical conductor inside the conductor what is the magnetic field here okay and what is the magnetic field outside of the cylindrical conductor this is the question what is the magnetic field when the radius here is smaller than the radius of the cylinder and what is the magnetic field when the radius is bigger than the radius of the cylinder so how to do that just apply the ampere's law pdl line integral for the closed pass which is equal to mu zero i enclosed so um b is constant take i mean b is constant on 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 that surface okay if you choose a surf if you choose a closed pass within this cylindrical conductor okay uh, b will be constant everywhere only its direction is changing changes uh, but its magnitude is constant so here we have V, uh, the integral of dl is, uh, give, is given 2 pi r, which is equal to mu zero i enclosed. So what is the current here, okay? This in the enclosed pass. What is the i enclosed? I know that current enclosed is given by j times a. This is current density, which we have learned in the previous lectures. This is the area of the uh, area of the um, conductor okay we can also call this one current per unit area let's consider that this is a unit uh, cylindrical conductor and then i enclosed can be written like this current density is given by if i take current density i over pi r square so total current passing through on that cylinder and the area of the uh, area of the dead cylinder this is the current density and constant everywhere okay within that cylinder and take this j put it there then i enclosed is given by i over pi r square and area of the uh, this this closed pass which is given by pi r square then take this i enclosed put it there then we have this expression b times 2 pi r which is equal to mu zero times i enclosed which we have calculated here put it there then the magnetic field inside the cylindrical conductor is given by that expression now let's continue with the um, magnetic field outside the conductor uh, or cylindrical conductor here. Again, we apply the Ampere's law. BDL is equal to mu zero times current enclosed within, within that closed pass. So outside of the conductor, here we have R, and R is bigger than the radius of the cylinder. And we have total current or enclosed current, which is given by I here. Okay, so outside the conductor then put this i here instead of i enclosed and then uh, b is constant take this out and the integral uh, dl will give us the circumference of the um, closed pass here this is given by 2 pi r which is equal to mu zero times i then the magnetic field is given by that expression so here we have a graph so here you see that the radius is increasing to the right side and this is the magnitude of the magnetic field what happens magnetic field as a function of the radius this is the radius of the cylinder r capital r okay so inside the cylinder here when the r is smaller than capital R inside of the cylinder, the B is given by that expression. 
proportional to r over r square this one and if you increase the r then b is increasing like this okay but what about the magnetic field outside the cylindrical conductor we have that expression if you increase the r then b will decrease okay with that expression like this now let's continue with the magnetic field produced by a solenoid this is again another example from the book what was the solenoid we have explained what is solenoid in previous lectures just shortly repeated a solenoid consists of helical winding of wire on a cylinder what we have here we have many many uh, loops okay many loops and here we have a current and if you apply right hand rule these fingers are showing the direction of the current then the thumb will show you the direction of the magnetic field so um, if the solenoid is long in comparison with its cross-sectional diameter this is the diameter of the solenoid and this is the length of the solenoid if this length is so big compared to the diameter then the magnetic field inside the solenoid near its midpoint somewhere here is very nearly uniform over the cross section and parallel to its axis like this okay so uh, the field lines are presented here the field lines are like this okay but inside of the solenoid if the length of the solenoid is huge compared to the diameter here at the center of the solenoid we have more or less uniform magnetic field okay you can consider it like this here we have uh, we have a um, very nice graph to understand the magnetic field of the solenoid as a function of the x x is this one so let's consider that this is x is zero and we are going to the positive side and this goes to the negative side so here in the center we have huge and more or less uniform magnetic field okay along that direction and then when we go to the left side or when we go to the right side the magnetic field goes down okay you see and here just at the end of the solenoid here and at the end of the solenoid the magnetic field is half of the magnetic field at the center then if you go further it goes down and it goes down like this so because we have less magnetic field lines here then uh, you can consider such integration paths in order to apply Ampere's law to find the field of a solenoid here we have um, turns many turns okay like this one and this is showing the direction of the current here into the page and here from the page to us because the this because the direction of the current is like this okay and we have magnetic field lines like this let's consider that we are just concentrated at the center we are we are concentrated uh, on, on the center then on the center of the solenoid we have homogeneous uniform magnetic field lines okay and we have an integration pass here just choose an integration pass here we have um, pass from a to b here from b to c from c to b d to a again so outside of the solenoid just just outside of the solenoid magnetic field is very very small you can consider that it is it is zero at what condition if the length of the solenoid is huge compared to its diameter okay outside of the solenoid here 
about the midpoint is more or less zero, very small, okay? You can, you can ignore it. Then um, let's try to calculate it. They will apply this Ampere's law, BDL is equal to mu, mu zero times I enclosed, but we have different paths here. One pass from A to B, another pass from B to C, C to D, and D to A. What do you see here? If you choose the L here in that direction and magnetic field is also in that direction, so they will give positive result. Here outside of the solenoid here, if it is very long, we can consider that magnetic field is zero, then BDL will be zero from that part. And here magnetic field and DL are perpendicular. Here DL and magnetic field are perpendicular. Then there will be zero contribution from that parts. So we will have only uh, contribution from that part of the line integral of B. So then we have only B1 from this one. Others will be zero. So this is given by BDL from A to B. B is constant. And what is DL? The length of the solenoid, okay? This L, length of the solenoid. Then put it there. Then we have um, BDL is equal to BL. And it is also equal to mu zero times I enclosed. And how to find I enclosed? Within the uh, solenoid, we have n turns per unit length. Okay. If we have n turns, let me draw. The total number of the turns are given by n times L. In unit length, we have n turns. And um, in the length of L, we have n times L turns. Okay, this is the total number of the turns within the solenoid. Then, what is current? Current is n times I. Okay, I is this one, and we have n turns. Okay, then n times. I mean, capital N times I will give us the um, current here enclosed within that um, integration pass. Then just take this I enclosed and put here in that equation mu zero times I enclosed. And on the left side, we have BL, we have already calculated. Then if you take B, the magnetic field of the solenoid, which is given by mu zero times n times current. What is this small n? The small n is the n turns per unit length. Okay, do we have any question here in that part? Then let me continue with the last example of that part, field of a toroidal solenoid, example 28.10. So what is toroidal solenoid or toroidal coil? It is like this, okay? You can see this type of uh, solenoids or coils in many electronic device, in power supplies, okay? Everywhere you can find this. Uh, it has very, um, very wide application in the in, in this industry. So, um, Figure shows a donut shaped toroidal solenoid tightly wound with n turns of wire carrying a current I. So uh, find the magnetic field at all points. So what is the magnetic field here at the center? What is the magnetic field within that toroidal material? What is the magnetic field outside of it? Okay. So this is the question. So I can, I can divide this one into the segments. What do you see here that we have wires, okay? And we drive current through that wires. Many wires and we drive current. So here, this is, this is the cross section of this one. 
these are showing the direction of the current from page to us. And here we have direction of the current from us to the page, okay? You see, due to that type of um, wires used in the toroidal solenoids. And uh, this is the uh, radius R. Now I am choosing three paths. The path one is within the toroidal solenoid. This is the path one. And I am choosing another path within the toroid, this one. And I have another path, which is path three, outside of the toroid. Okay, then let's try to calculate. Again, we will apply Ampere's law. B, 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 BDL is equal to mu zero I enclosed. Okay, let's start with the path one. What do you see here? What is the current within that path one? There is no current here. Okay, currents are here within that close pass, there is no current, then put zero here. This um, B in that region will be zero. And what about the um, magnetic field for this one, pass three? For pass three, if you choose a certain area, we have one current pointing us and another current direction pointing to the page, okay, into the page. So this is canceled by this one. This is canceled by this one. If you consider the total current within that pass. So I enclosed for pass three will also be zero. Then magnetic field will be zero outside of the toroid. So outside of the toroid in that region, there will be no magnetic field. And also in that region, there will be no magnetic field. And magnetic field is confined here shown by the blue color, okay? This is the direction of the current magnetic field, and this is the magnetic field confined within the toroidal solenoid, okay? So how to calculate it? Just again apply this one. What is I enclosed? Number of turns times the current here, and then put this one here, and BDL will give us B times two pi R radius uh, of this uh, pass, uh, radius of the circle here, or radius of the closed pass. And this is the circumference two pi R. Then two pi R B is equal to N times I. Okay, so mu zero times N times I due to that expression, Ampere's law. Then if you take B, you can find magnetic field here within that pass two. It is not zero because just look at the picture. Within pass two, we have only current into the page, okay? But in pass three, we have current into the page and we have current from page to us. So for this reason, the, the uh, magnetic field outside of the toroidal solenoid must be zero. Any question here in that part? Then let me continue application of Ampere's law. So look at this one. Here we have um, a coaxial cable. In the center we have central wire made from copper usually, okay? And here we have an insulator. And here we have another metal, but it is hollow conducting cylinder, and we have um, final uh, insulator, okay? This is the structure of the coaxial cable, uh, has many applications in telecommunications. In such a cable, a current runs in one direction along the hollow conducting cylinder. So within that conducting cylinder, we have a current, and same amount of current, is also passing through within that conductor. So let's consider that the current here is in, the, is in that direction to the right side and the current is to the left side. So the magnitude of the current is same and if you choose a closed pass 
we have two currents. One is in that direction, the other one is in the opposite direction in equal magnitude, then the enclosed current within that closed path will be zero. Then the magnetic field outside of the coaxial cable will be zero. This is very nice application of Ampere's law. Now let's continue with the magnetic materials. Magnetic materials are very important materials, widely used in the industry and also scientifically they are they are very important so as i showed you during the last lecture so here we have an electric motor here we have transformer here we have a magnetic crane okay so everywhere in generators in electromagnets we use magnetic materials we have coils okay usually made from the copper okay from the non magnetic metals but in addition to that coils we have a magnetic core here magnetic core here okay so in the center of the coil we have a magnetic material why we use it to increase the magnetic field and confine it to the destroyed region we will go into detail in addition to that, magnetic materials are widely used in, in technological devices, for example, in hard disk drives, in computers, okay? And uh, magnetic reed hats, again, uh, in, in, in HDDs are based on the magnetic materials, made from the magnetic materials. So very, very important field of science, and it makes money, uh, people, pays a lot of money okay to to buy magnetism based technologies every day every year so within that part first of all i will try to explain the atomic origins of magnetic properties then i will show you uh, some some um, classes of magnetism and their magnetic behaviors uh, i i will uh, shortly discuss the paramagnetism, diamagnetism, and ferromagnetism. So now let's let's uh, start with the Bohr magneton. Actually, Bohr um, magneton defines the magnetic moment of electron in atom. Okay, nucleus contains protons and neutrons. Right, this is nucleus, and we have one electron is traveling around the nucleus okay just consider like this so uh, the electron has two types of movement one is the orbital movement with some certain radius r and the another movement is that it's spin movement you can consider like this this is the sun and this is the earth okay what we know of that the earth is traveling around the sun in certain orbit okay and earth is also rotating around itself okay this movement has one year period and this movement around itself has one day period okay you can consider like this Electron has also this type of movement around the nucleus. One is orbital motion, the other one is spin motion of the electron in the orbit. So now let's try to understand. This is the electron and nucleus is located in the center. Let's consider, okay? Here let's consider we have nucleus and here we have electron and electron is traveling in circular orbit according to the Bohr atomic model with some certain radius. So what is electron? Electron is negatively charged particle and it is moving very fast around the nucleus. What was the moving of the charged particles? Moving of the charged particles is current, okay? Then you can consider that the be orbital behavior of the electron can be considered as current okay so what about the direction of the current if this is the 
velocity and movement direction of the electron, the current will be opposite. Okay, so we have current here. If you have current in that orbit, uh, according to the um, knowledge which we have discussed during the last lecture, we have magnetic moment which is given by I times area. This is the area of the um, area of the circle or pass of the uh, electron. And this is the direction of the mu magnetic moment due to the current, which is defined by the right hand rule. Okay, direction of the mu magnetic moment. So electrons within the orbits, within the atoms, have this type of magnetic moment. Okay, this which is orbital magnetic moment. So due to the spin motion of the electron, there is another magnetic moment, which is called as spin magnetic moment. Okay, so I think it is enough. So now we have a magnetic dipole moment mu associated with that electron. This is the current, this is the area, okay? What is the current within that orbit? In order to find the current, we can use that expression. This is charge, this is the time. What is this time? Period. It means that what is the time to complete one revolution? Time. And time is given by circumference over velocity to complete one revolution in that orbit. Okay. Then take this time, put it there, take this period, put it there. Then current will be given by that expression E times V over 2 pi R. R is the radius of the orbit, and um, E is the charge of the electron, V is the velocity of the electron in, in the circular orbit. Okay, then what was mu, magnetic moment, due to that current within the orbit, is I times area. I is this one, area is the area of the orbit, pi r square. Then finally, we have magnetic moment with that expression, EVR over two. And we have learned during the physics one, there is an angular momentum, okay? And if this is the direction of the velocity, if this is a circular moment, we have angular momentum L like this. And this angular momentum is given by that expression, mvr, mass of the electron, velocity of the electron, r is the radius of the orbit, okay? So here we have vr, here we have vr. Take this vr here and put it there. Finally, magnetic moment can be written in terms of angular momentum l, okay? So magnetic moment is given by E over 2m times L. This is the magnetic moment of the electron in the atom. So now, what about L? Okay, in quantum physics, we know that angular momentum L, this one, is quantized. What is the meaning of quantized? In Turkish, kesikli, it can take only certain values, okay? And uh, its component is always in an integer multiple of h over 2 pi. So for n is 1, for the first Bohr orbit, we can write L is equal to h over 2 pi, okay? So instead of L, just use this expression h over 2 pi, and then the magnetic moment of the electron in that circular orbit is given by E times H over 4 pi m. Here we have H, this is Planck's constant, okay? It is usually given in the questions if, if you have uh, this type of um, question. And what is this mu? Mu is universal constant and called as Bohr magneton, okay? And denoted by mu subsecript B, Bohr magneton. 
its numerical value is given by that expression, joule per Tesla, magnetic moment joule per Tesla. Why joule per Tesla? I can show you like this. Remember the potential energy, which is given by mu b, right? So, what is the unit of b? Tesla, right? Unit of energy, joule. Then, unit of magnetic moment, joule per Tesla, okay? So uh, this is the magnetic moment here we have calculated, okay, due to the orbital motion of the electron. And as I told you, there is another motion of electron, which is spin motion. And due to the spin motion of the electron, we have same amount of magnetic moment, spin magnetic moment, and it is also equal to the Bohr magneton. Do you have any question here in that part? So this is the, this is the origin of the magnetism, origin of the mag magnetic moment within the atoms, okay? So each atom has certain orbital magnetic moment and spin magnetic moment. Okay, now let's continue with the paramagnetism. In an atom, most of the various orbital and spin magnetic moments of the electrons add up to zero. Let's consider that here we have hydrogen atom, one proton in the nucleus and one electron in the orbit, okay? Then we have magnetic moment associated with it. But what about oxygen? It has eight electrons. What about cobalt? It has 27 um, electrons, okay? What about platinum? What about the palladium, okay? So they have many electrons. Usually in atoms, we have many electrons, okay? So if we have many electrons, most of the various orbital and spin magnetic moments of the electrons cancel each other. So then, um, there is no magnetic there is no magnetic moment from the atom but sometimes in some cases the atom has a net magnetic moment for example in in hydrogen in in oxygen in palladium in platinum the atoms have some certain net magnetic moment then you can show like this this is the atom it contains many many electrons okay Electrons are traveling in certain orbits, and in total, this atom has certain magnetic moment due to the orbital and spin motions of the electrons, okay? So let's consider that here you have a magnetic atom. It has certain magnetic moment. Then I apply magnetic field. So I know that there will be torque acting on that magnetic moment. Then the torque will be given by mu, times b, this is vectorial product. And the magnetic moment will be rotated along the magnetic field. It will be aligned like the, like, it will be aligned along the field. So if you apply enough magnetic field, within the material we have many atoms and the magnetic moments will be aligned along the magnetic field, okay? This is just single atom and within the material we have many atoms and each atom will be aligned due to the magnetic field applies torque on the magnetic moments, okay? Then the total magnetization of the system, total magnetic moment of the system per unit volume can be written like this. This is the magnetization which gives us the total magnetic moment from each atom per unit volume. Okay, this is the magnetization. Here we have very important information. The additional 
magnetic field due to the magnetization of the material turns out to be equal simply this value. So what it means, in the previous lecture, I have explained that if you have a magnetic moment, if you have a magnetic dipole, we have magnetic field lines from N to S, right? Here we have magnetic field lines of the magnetic field, external magnetic field. So in total, we will have balls. Look at this one. Let's consider this is B0. This is external magnetic field, okay? And these are the magnetic atoms. Each has mu magnetic moment, okay? And then due to the magnetic moments of the atoms, we have magnetic field lines. In total, we have, we have magnetic field lines like this. B0 is this one applied external magnetic field plus mu zero times magnetization of the material, okay? Due to the total magnetic moment of each atom in the system. This type of material is called as paramagnetic. Atoms have certain magnetic moment and if you apply magnetic field, you can align the magnetic moment along the magnetic field. So now look at that expression. If you divide this expression by B0, B over B0, B0 over B0, and this over B0. This is called as Km, relative permeability. This is one, and this will give us the magnetic susceptibility. If I take magnetic susceptibility from that expression, magnetic susceptibility is given by Km minus one. This magnetic susceptibility is very important and it is a positive number for paramagnetic materials, negative number for diamagnetic materials. And it is very small for paramagnetic materials, but, but ferromagnetic materials, this number is huge, okay, compared to the paramagnetic materials. So, so magnetic susceptibility is very important to classify the magnetic materials. Here I show you one example. This is a conducting wire, current carrying conducting wire. You can consider coil or solenoid. You drive current, then there will be magnetic field, okay? In addition to that, I put here a magnetic material and due to the magnetic field, the magnetic atoms of that magnetic material um, are aligned, then in total, I have magnetic field due to the current applied in the solenoid and then magnetization of the magnetic material. This gives us that uh, information. Okay, now let's try to discuss the behavior of paramagnetic materials as a function of temperature and magnetic field. If there is no magnetic field, the magnetic moments of the atoms of a paramagnetic material are aligned randomly, okay? There is no order within the material. So let's consider that each arrow here is showing the magnetic moment of the atoms. This is one atom, another atom, another atom, okay? They have magnetic moments. Since the material is paramagnetic, there is no magnetic order at the beginning. But whenever I apply external magnetic field, I have this torque and align all magnetic moments along the magnetic field, like this. Then all magnetic moments, all atoms, all magnetic atoms are aligned along the magnetic field. Okay? So what happens if I increase the temperature in that condition? I have, let's consider still I have magnetic field. Magnetic field tries to align the magnetic moment along the field, but temperature fights against the magnetic field and randomize the magnetic moments again. 
For this reason, as a function of temperature, magnetic susceptibility goes down. At high temperatures, susceptibility is very small for paramagnetic materials. This was the susceptibility, okay, which is proportional to the magnetization, okay. Susceptibility comes from the magnetization. So you can consider that magnetization goes down in case of paramagnetic materials as a function of temperature. If you increase the temperature, then susceptibility goes down and there is a magnetic disorder within the material. And what about the behavior of the magnetization as a function of magnetic field? I am applying magnetic field in that direction and magnetization increases in that direction because all magnetic moments are aligned along the field, okay? As a function of the magnetic field. And if there is no magnetic field, magnetization is zero, okay? Because magnetic moments are aligned randomly. There is no magnetic order, okay? So if I apply magnetic field in opposite direction, for example, if you apply magnetic field in that direction, then all magnetic moments will be aligned along that direction. Then magnetization direction will be like this in the negative direction. Okay, so now let's uh, continue with the diamagnetism. So um, what I have told you that in some materials, the total magnetic moment of all the atomic current loops is zero like this. Here we have discussed, okay? Here we have one electron and it has certain current because it is uh, traveling in that orbit with certain velocity. And due to that current, we have that magnetic moment, okay? Which is given by that expression and we have calculated like this. So if you have another electron here, it will have different spin, opposite spin, according to the Pauli exclusion principle. I will not go into detail. And the magnetic moment produced by that one will be canceled another magnetic moment produced by another electron here, second electron here, okay? If you have two electrons in the system. So there are such materials, okay, in nature. So, the total magnetic moment of all the atomic current loops is zero. Then, what do you see here? We have atoms, but they don't have net magnetic moments, okay? They are not magnetic. They are non-magnetic atoms you can consider. But if you apply magnetic field to that atoms, the current, within that orbit will be manipulated by the applied magnetic field. If you apply magnetic field, the current within the orbits of the electrons within that atoms will be manipulated. This causes an additional current loops and induced magnetic moment. Initially, they have no magnetic moment, so due to the applied external field, they have induced magnetic moment. And the direction of the induced magnetic moment is opposite to the applied magnetic field. In paramagnetic materials, atoms itself are magnetic, okay? I just apply magnetic field and I align them. But in case of diamagnetic materials, atoms are not magnetic. When I apply magnetic field, I produce in these magnetic moments since the field alters electron motions within the atoms, causing additional current loops, okay? Then we have induced magnetic moments opposite to the applied field. If the field is zero, then we have that condition. If you apply magnetic field, we have magnetic induced magnetic moments in opposite direction to the field. So we will discuss uh, what is this induced magnetic moments in the next uh, chapter, which is explained by the Faraday's law of induction. 
So now let's um, summarize the behavior of diamagnetic materials. Initially, the magnetization is zero because no net magnetic moment from the atoms. But whenever we apply magnetic field, there are induced magnetic moments, but the direction of the magnetic moments are opposite to the uh, direction of the magnetic field. Then the, when you increase the magnetic field in positive direction, magnetization increases in negative direction. When you increase the magnetic field in negative direction, magnetization increases in positive direction. You see, due to that behavior, opposite behavior. So what about the magnetic susceptibility as a function of temperature? In paramagnetic materials, when you heat the material, magnetization and susceptibility goes down by temperature. In case of diamagnetic materials, their magnetic susceptibilities are independent of temperature. So susceptibility is negative due to this opposite behavior. Susceptibility is negative, okay? And the susceptibility is independent of temperature. So it means that susceptibility is more or less constant with temperature. It does not change with temperature. So now we have magnetic susceptibilities of certain materials. These are the paramagnetic materials, oxygen, gas, aluminum, for example. And you can consider um, palladium, platinum, okay? So we have positive magnetic susceptibility, you see? But in case of diamagnetic materials, we have negative magnetic susceptibility due to that opposite behavior, for example, bismuth, silver, carbon, diamond, copper, okay? They are diamagnetic materials and they have negative numbers. Now, maybe you will, see, you will say that why these materials are important, why we are learning that topic. So both paramagnetic materials and diamagnetic materials have very nice applications in industry, in, in advanced technologies, and also for medical applications, okay? For example, you would like to put an implant material into the body, okay? Maybe you heard about platinum implantation, okay? So sometimes bones are broken and they are connected by platinum, okay? So platinum is paramagnetic and it has very low magnetic susceptibility, okay? So paramagnetic materials are not magnetic without magnetic field. For this reason, uh, you, can, uh, you can use them as an implant material for medical purposes. Of course, the material uh, must also be biocompatible, okay? But this is out of discussion here. And also for diamagnetic materials. So you would like to produce a device or stage, okay? And then you need a non-magnetic material, which is not magnetic, okay? Then, then you can use diamagnetic materials. So they have very small susceptibility and uh, they have negative susceptibilities. For example, copper, silver, bismuth, especially copper is very widely used, okay, for many technological applications since it is diamagnetic. This is the example 2811, magnetic dipoles in a paramagnetic material. So what is the question? Nitric oxide is a paramagnetic compound. The magnetic moment of each nitric oxide molecule has a maximum component in any direction of about one Bohr magneton. Okay, magnetic moment of that molecule is around one Bohr magneton. Compare the interaction energy of such magnetic moments in a 1.5 Tesla magnetic field with the average translational kinetic energy of molecules at 300 Kelvin. So we have nitric oxide molecules. Uh, they are magnetic, okay? Then you apply 1.5 Tesla, okay? Then what is the energy? 
torque is given by that expression, energy is given by the scalar product of this one. I have already discussed this one. Then the energy is given by that expression minus mu times b. And what is the magnetic moment around one Bohr magneton? What is the magnetic field? 1.5 Tesla. Uh, the unit of Bohr magneton is joule per Tesla. Here we have Tesla. This Tesla cancels this Tesla. And the result is joule. Or you can write it in electron volt. Okay. And um, what is the translational kinetic energy of the molecules? Translational kinetic energy uh, is given by that expression we have seen in physics one. 3 half kT, this is Boltzmann constant, this K. T is the temperature which is given here in Kelvin, 300 Kelvin, okay? Then the result is Joule because energy, and you can convert it to the electron volt, which is also used for the energy. So what do you see here? Translational kinetic energy is 0 0.039 electron volt, and potential energy is much, much smaller, okay, 10 to minus 5 electron volt. So, um, finally, I will continue this ferromagnetism and I finish that chapter. In ferromagnetic materials, we have atomic magnetic moments like paramagnetism. I mean, we have magnetic atoms, okay? But in addition to the paramagnetic materials, in ferromagnetic materials, we have such alignment without magnetic field. In case of paramagnetic materials, we have magnetic atoms and they are aligned randomly. Net magnetization is zero because they cancel each other. If you apply magnetic field, they are aligned. But in ferromagnetic material, without any magnetic field, we have this type of magnetic order of magnetic moments. This is the main difference of the ferromagnetism. And uh, in ferromagnetic materials, material is divided into the magnetic domains, magnetic regions, we can say. Here we have one magnetic domain another magnetic domain, another magnetic domain, another magnetic domain, another magnetic domain. So within each domain, we have, let's say, millions of atoms, magnetic atoms, and they are aligned in same direction within the magnetic domains. Here we have millions of atoms. Their magnetic moments are aligned along that direction. Here in same direction, here in same direction. But in total, the net magnetization of the system is zero since this cancels this one, this cancels this one, and this is also canceled another magnetic domain. Okay, but within each domain, we have net magnetization. So when we apply field, magnetic field, the magnetic domains along the field will be bigger, you see? Why? Because energy in that direction will be minimum. Let me, let me write the energy expression. Energy is given by minus mu times B. Okay? I can, I can also write this expression like this. Um, minus mu B cosine phi. Phi is the angle between magnetic moment and B. So when the magnetic moment and B are parallel to each other, what is phi? Phi is zero, then cosine phi is one. When the magnetic moments are anti-parallel anti -parallel to the magnetic field like this, then phi is 180 degrees, cosine phi is 
minus one. For that condition, put cosine phi here, one, then the potential energy will be minus mu times B if they are parallel to each other. For that condition, potential energy minus here from cosine 180 for the anti-parallel orientation, we will have another minus one, then plus mu times B if they are anti-parallel to each other, okay? So which energy is minimum? Of course, this is minimum. Then all magnetic moments here will be aligned along the field. I'm applying field in that direction. Then magnetic moments, magnetic domains along the field will be bigger. You see, this is the size of domain at the beginning. Now the size of the domain after applying magnetic field because energy is minimum in that direction. Energy is minimum along the magnetic field. So energy is maximum opposite to the magnetic field. So all magnetic moments, all magnetic domains would like to be aligned along the magnetic field. If you apply um, higher magnetic fields, then these domains along the magnetic field will be bigger and the opposite domains will be smaller. Okay, so if you further increase the magnetic field, what will happen? If you apply huge magnetic fields, all magnetic domains will be aligned along the field. This is the field direction, okay? So this one, this one, this one, all of them will be aligned along the magnetic field because energy is minimum along the field. Do we have any question in that part? Okay, then what about the magnetization of the ferromagnetic materials? This is the magnitude of the magnetic field. At the beginning, there is no magnetic field. So magnetic atoms are aligned along the same direction within the domains, but they are aligned randomly in microscopic weave. Then the net magnetization is zero. When I apply magnetic field, there will be a net magnetization along the field. If I further increase the magnetic field, magnetization will be maximum, okay? This is saturation magnetization. It means that all magnetic moments are aligned along the magnetic field. But what happens if I reverse the direction of the magnetic field? Will I go to the opposite direction of that curve? No. If I go to the opposite direction, then I will have such behavior or such behavior. So look at the paramagnetic materials. This is the direction of the magnetic field, positive direction of magnetic field, negative direction of the magnetic field. You have this type of behavior, okay? We are on the same line. In case of diamagnetic materials, direction of the magnetic field, direction of the magnetic field. So we are on the same line if you reverse the magnetic field. But in case of ferromagnetic materials, you can never go back. Okay, it will be like this. And this is a specific property of each ferromagnetic material, which is called as hysteresis curve. It comes from the history. Material remembers its um, magnetic history, okay? So this condition, look at that condition. External magnetic field is zero here. And I have huge magnetization. Here in paramagnetism, when the external magnetic field is zero, magnetization is zero. In diamagnetism, when the field is zero, magnetization is zero. But in case of ferromagnetic materials, even under the zero magnetic field, we have huge magnetization. I mean, once 
you apply magnetic field and you get the saturation magnetization, you align all magnetic moments, all magnetic domains along the field, they preserve their condition. For this reason, these ferromagnetic materials are widely used in data storage industry. You store information in hard disk drives in computers and it stays there. Okay, so, um, and it is, it, it, it has very, um, very important market in, in technological uh, devices. So, um, here we have another property here. We apply magnetic field and then magnetization becomes zero. Okay field is zero here, but here at certain field, magnetization of the ferromagnetic material is zero. This is called as coarsive field and very important again for technological applications. If you would like to produce permanent magnets uh, for many other applications, if you would like to produce um, hard magnets, you have to use such magnetic materials. But in electromagnets, for example, okay, if you, if you need such behavior, it means that uh, less magnetic fields are required to destroy the magnetization of the material and to reach the huge magnetizations very fast with very low magnetic fields, then this type of materials, ferromagnetic materials are chosen. And these are called as soft magnetic materials this is called as hard magnetic material with very large uh, coarse field. Here we have lower coarse fields. Now we have example for a ferromagnetic material, example 28.12 from the book, a cube shaped permanent magnet here is made of a ferromagnetic material with a magnetization M of about eight times 10 to five M per meter, the side length is two centimeter, two centimeter by two centimeter. Find the magnetic dipole moment of the magnet and estimate the magnetic field due to the magnet at a point 10 centimeter from the magnet along its axis. So let's consider that this is the magnet's axis. This is N pole, the other one is S pole, let's say. And 10 centimeter away from the magnet, what is the magnetic field? So uh, in order to calculate magnetic moment, we can use that formula. Magnetization is given by magnetic moment over unit volume. And uh, we know the magnetization which is given and volume is given put them into the equation, then we can calculate the total magnetic moment of the system, six ampere times meter square. So what is the magnetic field, 10 centimeter away from the magnet, which is given by mu zero mu total over that expression. We have, um, find, we have found that relation during the last lecture. So what is X? The distance, of, for, the distance from the origin of that material, okay, which is given 10 centimeter. What is A? Um, we have got this expression uh, for a cylindrical shape, okay? Uh, so so um, for this one, maybe it is not correct, but, but um, if we can consider that this A, I mean, one centimeter, let's say this is a circular radius of A, one centimeter, and we are talking about the magnetic field 10 centimeter away from this one. So X is much bigger than A, then we can uh, ignore this one. If we ignore this one, we will have that expression. Okay, so then mu zero is constant, which is given in the questions, uh, and mu total, we have calculated, put it there, then X is 10 centimeter or 0.1 meter, then 
we have magnetic field is 10 Gauss. This is 10 times stronger than the Earth's magnetic field. So now let's finish with that transparency, a bio application of magnetic nanoparticles for cancer therapy. You know, maybe you hear from your friends, from, from the media that there are two main therapies in order to kill the cancer cells. One is chemotherapy and the other one is radiotherapy, right? So uh, both of them are useful, but they also kill non-cancer cells, okay? and destroy the patients. So in order to avoid the side effects of the radiotherapy and chemotherapy, there is another method. This is still under investigation. Many people, uh, many scientists are working on that issue, magnetic nanoparticles for cancer therapy. So um, what you see here, this is a picture. The violet blobs in this microscope image are cancer cells that have broken away from a tumor and threatened to spread throughout the patient's body, this violet colors. An experimental technique for fighting these cells uses particles of a magnetic material shown in brown, magnetic nanoparticles, you see brown color, injected into the body, these particles are coated with chemical that preferentially attaches to the cancer cells. A magnet outside the patient then steers the particle out of the body, taking the cancer cells with them. Okay, so there are also other methods to get the good image of the cancer region. This is very important for, for treatment of the uh, cancer region in the body. And uh, sometimes these magnetic nanoparticles are used to selectively destroy the cancer cells. Okay, there are many, many um, scientific works on that issue. Maybe within, within years, within five years or 10 years, these methods will be applicable uh, in, in the hospital for the, um, for, for, for the cancer therapy. Do we have any question in that part? So next week you will have midterm exam. Okay, you are resp responsible from chapter 21 to end of the chapter 27, the lecture of last week. So repeat all um, lectures and try to solve all problems at the end of the chapters in the book. Okay. Do you have any question? Take care of yourself. See you then. Bye-bye.